This is the Used Car Dealer Podcast. Hello, everyone. It's Zach here, and we have a very special guest on the podcast. Someone who's been a mentor and influential to me in my career is an entrepreneur, Matt Watson. Matt is a serial entrepreneur and the founder of Vin Solutions, which was a bootstrapped automotive CRM acquired by Cox Automotive for over $135 million. Matt, thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, how's it going? Glad to be here. I had another co-founder. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't the only founder, and you know, ironically enough, I've been corrected of that a few times. The uh, the other gentleman doesn't like it when I'm called the founder. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how that works. Yeah. Well, let's start from the beginning in the early days. You know, what was the initial idea that started Vin Stickers, which later became Vin Solutions? Yeah. So actually, um, a bit of history for those that are listening about uh, Vin Solutions that have used it, which seems like almost everybody in automotive has used Vin Solutions at this point. If you've worked at more than two or three car dealers, you've probably probably been around it. Um, the original name was actually Dealer Tech. Um, it started off as Dealer Tech and then changed names to Vin Stickers. Um, the way that this originally worked is um, I had a friend that owned a car dealership and I had done a little bit of software for him to help just manage his inventory and customers. And, um, you know, I didn't know much about automotive or anything like that. And, and I, at this time I was like 19 years old, 20 years old when I was helping this car dealer do this stuff. I had no idea what I was doing, but, um, so the story goes, somebody that worked at auto trader, uh, ironically enough was taking pictures of cars and, uh, was looking for some software to upload them to the internet. Now, this was 2003 when uh, the business started. Now, to put things in perspective, the iPhone didn't come out until 2006. Even in 2003, a digital camera was a pretty rare item. It was definitely a luxury item. You know, some of them even still had the big three and a half floppy disks. You know, SD cards and compact flash cards were you know, hot technology then that had, that had just been invented. And it, it was just a different time. And it's hard to wrap our heads around that. You know, it's only been 17 years, but it was a different <laughs> time. But, um, you know, what the other gentleman found is he was going around trying to sell these, you know, fancy new listings for this new website called autotrader.com because he also worked for Auto Trader Magazine. And every one of the dealers had the same response of like, who the hell is going to take the photos of these cars? If you'll take the photos, I'll sign up for autotrader.com. And so that was the problem. And, you know, ultimately that's why dealer specialties got started and, you know, some other companies that were doing that service. And so that, that was the idea. And, um, you know, he, he, uh, was servicing the same car dealer that was a friend of mine and the car dealer, you know, knew I was a software developer and stuff and said, Hey, you know what? You need to talk to Matt. So, uh, me and this other gentleman sat down at Applebee's one day and decided to start a company, and the the rest was sort of history from there. But it it started out as like, how do we uh, sort of like recreating dealer specialties kind of product of just like how do we take pictures of cars, uh, print window stickers for them, upload the inventory to you know AutoTrader.com and Cars.com and, and other sites like that, and it started out as a really simple idea, and we. Uh, reached we, we needed the like the VIN decoding data of like all the options and stuff and we reached out to another company that was based in Massachusetts and ended up actually merging uh, with them and that's where the name VIN stickers came from. They actually had kind of been had came up with that name and were using that name. Um, so yeah that's kinda that's kind of where the, the name started and the original idea. So how did it become a CRM system. How did the product kind of evolve over time? Yeah, probably around 2006 or seven, we started playing with building a internet lead management system. And so I'll credit a little bit of this to Mike DeLay, uh, DeLay uh, who came in and, and anybody who was around the industry at this time probably remembers DeLay from, from Ben. He went on to be the, the CEO of Ben for a while too. Um, he was, had been working at dealerships and was doing consulting and stuff around some other CRM uh, products from the industry. Super nice guy, super smart, you know, super product oriented. 
And I just worked, we just kind of worked together and said, you know what, let's build an internet lead management system. That's where it started because there really weren't any good internet lead management systems at the time. Like back in 2006 or seven, if you wanted to send an email out of Reynolds CRM, you had to know how to type HTML. Like that's how screwed up it was, right? Like wow. these things weren't designed for sending email. They sure as heck weren't designed for the most simple thing of like email me a picture of the car. Like that was a complicated thing to do, right? And um, they just didn't handle internet leads. That you know, all the existing CRM systems were designed for you know long term sales follow up or service follow up. You know, tracking appointments and you know, test drives and stuff like that, like basic CRM stuff that a lot of car dealers did. There was a few ILM players. I don't remember who they were. There was one that uh, seemed like it was connected to cars.com somehow. There there were two or three that had kind of cropped up that were, but, and it's like at that time, car dealers were getting, they had an ILM for their internet leads and then it had a CRM separately because all the existing CRM gear, CRMs like higher gear and Reynolds and stuff like that were so horrible at the internet lead stuff. So we kind of went after the internet lead stuff. And, and honestly, that was probably what really propelled then to be what it became is, is we did such a good job at handling internet leads. And then we coupled that with websites. We did websites for the dealers. And, and then around like 2008 or 2009, we started doing the full CRM side of it. And that kind of, you know, tracking appointments and, you know, showroom visits and sales follow up and stuff like that. So that, that was kind of the, the history of it. And what was software implementation like for dealers who, you know, back then, you know, technology and dealerships didn't go hand in hand like today. So what was like the early days of implementation and setting up some of the first stores on VIN? You know, the good thing about VIN solutions, and this was one of the things that was unique and they were, you know, kind of on the on the forefront was it was a SaaS based product. It was a cloud based product, right? It wasn't like higher gear or Reynolds CRM or, you know, some of these other products that you had to, you know, buy a server, install it at the dealer and then, you know, all that kind of crap. So it was pretty turnkey as far as like signing up and getting going and configuring it was was really pretty simple. The hardest part of any kind of CRM system is importing their existing data. Like going into right. <laughs> Reynolds or higher gear, or one of those things, right? And getting their old uh, customer data out of it. That part of it was always a nightmare. And then importing that stuff and deduping it and cleaning it up. And that part of it was a nightmare, absolute nightmare. And I'm, I'm sure you have a little bit of experience with that yourself, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And working with all the different providers. So, yeah. Another question, dealers often, they'll give you feedback and one dealer might run their store completely different from another dealership. How did you balance all the product feedback, you know, in building VIN solutions? And were there any quirks or kind of funny stories of just putting a feature in to please a dealer? Oh, dude. Um, you know, honestly, this... Well, to back up for a second, I mean, this is the conundrum that every single software company has, right? Like, everybody comes at you with like, hey, will you add this switch or this bell or this whistle or this toggle, toggle, this lever? And then if you do all of those things, eventually nobody has any idea how the software works because there's too many levers and switches. And honestly, that's kind of where Vin Solutions got is... You know, not only did we have like CRM and internet lead management and websites and desking and inventory management and like, you know, we have all these different products, but then if every one of them has like a hundred different settings, literally nobody knows how it all works. There's just too many switches and stuff, right? And that that's the complexity of all that stuff. And it's a conundrum that literally every software company has of trying, at some point in time, you have to just say no to your customers. And um, one of the jokes I used to have is, uh, I, pe- some of our customers would ask for some really crazy things or other companies we partnered with for, would ask for some crazy things. And, and people around the office may remember me saying this is I'd always say like, Hey, if they want to buy the company, they can make it do whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, like we just can't do all this stuff. My right. favorite story, my favorite, uh, story ever from this was we were working with some dealership. 
who was pretty high volume and they had like a, you know, the BDC that was setting appointments and they didn't want any of the salespeople to know when the appointments were coming in. They wanted us to be able to like hide the appointments in the system from the salespeople. And we just thought that was the like dumbest idea we'd ever heard of. So, um, <laughs> You know, we, we we heard some pretty pretty wacky things. That that one was one of my favorites, though. No, that's great. And I think one really interesting way that you built Vin Solutions that you don't see a lot today is that you bootstrapped it. You know, nowadays you'll have a SaaS company and they might raise you know three or five million dollar pre seed, you know, pre product round. And you bootstrapped Vin Solutions. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Yeah, that was a really difficult experience. I mean, we started in 2003, like I mentioned, and we had some customers right away for taking pictures of cars and uploading them. So we had a little bit of revenue coming in right away. And basically, because we were doing that service, the software was kind of secondary. It was kind of like internal software to start out with, if that makes sense. Um, so that that enabled that enabled us to get a little bit of revenue, right? And and keep and keep moving. We weren't one hundred percent dependent on having like some perfect software product to sell. Um, so we just kind of kept going, and you know, I was really the only developer for like the first couple of years, and <laughs> you know, I really didn't I really didn't make any money. I was working a full time job, and then eventually, I started working like. Uh, I remember I'd get up at like five in the morning and I would work six in the morning till noon at my wow. full time gig, which was a, I was a software developer for a medical laboratory. And then I'd come home after noon and then work basically till like 10 o'clock at night. And then we, so then it was just like me and my, my business partner at the time was in charge of sales. And that was it. That was the whole company. It was the two of us. And then eventually we hired my dad. Uh, his name is David uh, Watson, and I'm actually at his house right now, and he still works at Venn Solutions to this day. So it's been like wow. 15 years. Uh, he was employee number one, and he's still there. And then eventually he – so originally he was coming over, and he would work with me at my house. We worked in our basement. And then eventually we hired uh, one of my good friends, a guy named Michael, and he was basically employee number two. Uh besides the founders and he still also works there. So wow. that that was like the four of us were really the company for like the first two to three years there until we started going. And then, uh, yeah, we just kind of bootstrapped it. And, you know, at that time, like I wouldn't have even known what a startup was. Didn't know what the word entrepreneur meant. Like none of that stuff. I, I couldn't have told you about VCs funding, never once tried to raise any money we were just building a product. Like we were just servicing our customers. I mean, there, there, it was not like a trying to get on the front page of TechCrunch. Like we didn't care about any of that kind of shit. We were trying to solve a <laughs> legitimate problem and we had people that were paying us for it. You know, um, we're, we have this whole different mentality now. It seems like for like this whole startup culture, it's like all about raising money and right. making it on TechCrunch or Hacker News and all this shit. Um, we were just actually trying to run a business. <laughs> um, Around 2000, I mean, we always, you know, struggled from the cash perspective because we didn't really have any money. Right. Um, around 2008, nine, um, we tried to raise money. We actually hired a CFO who came in and worked on raising some money. Um, but that's right when the economy crashed, right? So Ford closed a lot of dealers, shit. Jim and Chrysler went bankrupt. Um, so it was like the worst possible time to try and raise money from a VC or, or you know, lenders. So we, we ended up kind of, you know, holding on for dear life. And, uh, and actually, uh, ironically, that's actually what helped propel the growth of Venn Solutions was that, that recession. Interesting. You know, nobody ever thinks about, nobody ever thinks about this, but whenever there's like these sort of events that happen, take like the you know what's going on with coronavirus right now right like amc theaters the largest theater chain in the country is decimated either gonna go bankrupt or permanently close their doors not even go bankrupt but like literally just shut the door and never come back right but there are other businesses that are absolutely booming right 
and other industries or, or, you know, online streaming of movies is probably booming, but AMC theaters is dead, right? Well, Vin Solutions was in, was at that right place too, because like I said, we were focused on internet leads. So at that time, the dealers were still, you know, spending, you know, $20,000 a month to advertise an auto trader magazine and get a full page ad in the newspaper wow. and, you know, TV ads and radio ads, like all this stuff, right? Well, all of a sudden they're like, hey, we can save 20 grand a month, 50 grand a month on advertising. We'll sign up for cars.com and autotrader.com and we'll buy this VIN Solutions thing. We'll take our own pictures. We can fire dealer specialties. We'll save money on that. So, you know, the dealers got into this cost savings mode, but they needed our product to still stay in business. Does that make sense? And so yeah. what what's funny is, you know, you go back to like 2007 or 2008, you call up the dealers and you're like, hey, I got a better product. It can save you money. You know, they're like, hey, we're making lots of money. We don't care. Like there's money flying everywhere. Nobody gives a shit. Who cares about saving money? We got more <laughs> money we know what to do with. Right? Right. I mean, that's the mode most people are. When you make a lot of money, they don't really care what they spend it on. But as soon as they start losing money, holy shit, they're squeezing every penny, right? Exactly. And so we, we we were at the right place at the right time. And that really kind of helped not only help Vin Solutions, but probably really helped Cars.com, AutoTrader.com, eBay Motors, Craigslist, like all these sort of things really took off, really pushed the whole e-commerce side the, in that, you know, that kind of time period, I think is where that kind of turned the corner. And the death of, you know, Remember, remember when people used to like get the newspaper and they were like cars.com had a special deal with all the newspapers and there would be big things about cars like who the hell gets right. a newspaper anymore, right? Like all that shit died. And so it was about that time period where all of that kind of turned the corner. And would you say that was around the time you guys started to really scale? And what was that experience like going from kind of business as usual and starting to really scale, pick up things while being bootstrapped? Yeah. And so around, I would say probably around 2007, 2008, we started, we were doubling business about year over year. About every 12 months we were doubling. So, you know, we went from... right. 50 employees to 100 to 200, right? And then same thing with revenue. You know, it was 5 million in revenue to 10 million and 20 million in revenue. So that gets really, really painful, you know? And it, it gets, it's absurdly painful. And everybody says they want to have that problem. You know, they want more business they know what to do with. But we literally have that problem. We were signing up 50, 60, 70, 80 new car dealers a month to use our product, right? Wow. And as I mentioned earlier, Installing them was a pain in the ass. Getting their CRM data and importing it. We got to build them a website. We got to yep. figure out, we got to export their data to AutoTrader and cars.com and all this stuff, like all this configuration. And our implementation team was ready to jump off a cliff. And w they were just so <laughs> backlogged. We just could not get people signed up and implemented fast enough. So then what happens? Well, now all of our salespeople, we had like 50 salespeople at this time in like 2010. All they do is take calls all day, pissed off from the people they signed, they sold to like two months ago because oh, we man. haven't installed them. So then the salespeople just spend all their day dealing with pissed off people. And then they're chewing out our implementation team and they're not selling anything. Like, I mean, you it's, it's just get into this like disaster that you don't want to deal with. Like, it sounds like a great problem of like, yeah, we're selling so much. We don't know what to do with it. It's not good. It's a it's a hard place to be. Man. And you know, now with COVID nineteen, you know, really disrupting even the auto industry, I wanted to move on and talk about kind of disruption. So when I think of disruption in the auto space, I think about Tesla and what they're doing with EV vehicle sales. I think about the autonomous technology that's really captured, you know, venture capital's mind. And then Carvana and now Vroom that recently went public that are, you know, selling vehicles online. What are your thoughts on some of the disruptors in the auto space? Yeah, I think it's definitely, we're definitely seeing a big shift. And obviously, the franchise dealers, of course, are really nervous about all the franchise you know, part of it and the franchise rights and, 
you know, there's a, a big negative viewpoint about Tesla because they don't use franchise dealers. Like you've got all that side of it too, right? And then you've got um, people like Vroom and Carvana and, you know, even CarMax and other like these huge companies that are very focused on used cars, right? And that is kind of eating away at the dealer's uh, ability as well. I I think the other thing that's fundamentally shifted is, and some of it may be a generational thing, some of it's the, the internet, is the, I, th- I feel like today's buyers are so much more educated about a car that mm-hmm. more often than not, when they walk in to buy the car, they know more about the car than the salesperson who has only worked there for four months and will probably only work there for two more months and then will leave. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's the reality of automotive. I think there's like a hundred percent turnover every year. Like nobody works at a car dealership more than 12 months on average. And that was one of the things I always joked about, you know, at VIN, people would ask me, well, do you have experience in automotive? I'm like, no, I haven't sold cars, but I have dramatically more experience than like 99% of the other people who actually sell cars because they've <laughs> only worked there for 12 months. I've never That's actually good. sold cars, but I've been around this shit for a long time um, because the turnover is so high. And that, that's a big, a big problem in the industry. And, and I, I feel like there's a, a lot of people just like me that I don't want to be sold to either. I just want to buy. Like, I just want to walk in, point at that thing, ask a couple questions and buy it. Like, I don't want to go through this whole sales process and haggling and negotiation. Like, I honestly don't even care if the, if the price is necessarily four hundred dollars more or less i I don't care i just want to buy the damn car right and i I think that's a a big part of it and be honest um one of my uh nephews was just recently selling cars like three months ago at a ford dealership right down the street here and he would be the first one to tell you like it was the most immoral thing anybody had ever asked him to do in his life of trying to purposely screw every single person that came in the door and I know not all car dealers are like that, but there are still car dealers that act like that. My nephew just worked at one down the street, and wow. and that shit still goes on. And you know that that's that's part of the, the you know the problem and the image, the long term image of you know getting out the four square and negotiating and penciling and all that sort of stuff. And you got Jim Ziegler, you know, saying, "Well, if you had to, could you pay $500 a month?" And, you know, and his response is like, "Well, of course we're going to tell the customer because you have to." Right? Like, you know, all that kind of shit that goes into this instead of just letting the customers make choices, you know, and being transparent. Right. And I think that's what we're seeing, you know, companies like Tesla and Vroom and Carvana and and CarMax and like a lot of these other uh, big companies have much more transparency, better salespeople, a different buying process. You know, I've I've owned three different Teslas, and the buying process for a Tesla is dramatically different than anything else. You are at, at no point are you really ever sold to. They're, they're, they're the people that work there are order takers, and mm. the whole transaction is really done online. Like, you know, it's not like this perfectly slick you know, online buying process that's like magical. They're still, you know, they still FedEx me some paperwork that I had to fill out and send them. Um, It's not like it was this purely magical paper. It wasn't this perfectly magical paperless thing, Um, but it was still all done remotely. And, you know, I didn't have to actually talk. I didn't actually have to see anybody that worked there until I went to pick up the car. And then it was like, Hey, sign here, sign here. Here we go. See ya. It wasn't like, okay, hold on. We're going to go in the back room. I'm going to pin you down and I'm going to try and sell you a bunch of extra shit you didn't want to buy, like, uh, you know, this undercarriage protection and extended warranty and gap insurance. Like, they don't even try to sell any of those things. Like, those aren't even a thing. They don't even do that. It's just a different experience. Right. And, you know, Tesla being a new car you're buying online, when you think about buying like a used car, in your opinion, can every used car be sold online? Are there situations like I want to see a V4 versus a V6 or, you know, I'm buying a car with 80,000 plus miles. I want to test drive it, inspect it in person before buying it online. What are your thoughts in that regard? Well, I think there's definitely at least a couple different segments there, right? You've got the used cars that are 
one to three years old. They're probably certified. They're super clean. They're in, you know, near perfect condition. Like, I think that's definitely different. Like th- those are a lot easier, right? It's, it's right. the older cars. They're like, uh, eh, this thing kind of idles a little weird and it smells a little strange. And, you know, it's got some bumps and bruises and all that stuff. I mean, you know, I think those definitely are a little, a little different. And, you know, the used car part of this is never going to change. It's never going to go away. No matter what happens with buying cars online or franchises and all this stuff. I mean, used cars are always going to exist. Right. That part of it is never going to change. And in terms of like all of the talk about autonomous vehicles, you know, being someone who's technical and an engineer, you know, what's your thought on that technology? So I feel like one of these days we will figure it out. I think there's still going to be a whole lot of gotchas with it. I mean, obviously it's not going to work very well in fog and heavy rain and snow and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Right. Um, or there's construction and the road's not where the car thinks the road's going to be. I mean, there's, there's all that sort of stuff. And I feel like the biggest problem with all of it is liability. You know, there was a, a Tesla the other day, there's like just as a week ago that was going down the highway. I, th- I want to say this was actually happened in Asia and right. the driver wasn't, wasn't paying any attention. It was an autopilot and there like a semi truck had flipped over. And so there was a semi truck just in the middle of the road and the Tesla saw it, but not until it was too late. Like it couldn't, it didn't, it didn't recognize it, you know, 500 yards ahead where the human would have seen it 500 yards ahead or like and enough ahead that you could have braked, right? The Tesla didn't really recognize it until maybe it got 50 yards away or 20 yards away. And at that point in time, it, it, it broke, you know, it, it used the brakes, but it was too late. Um, because these cars are, are used to like going with the flow of traffic. You know, they're used to the object in front of it might be going 60 miles an hour and it's going 70. So it's got to slow down a little bit. It's not used to something abruptly being stopped in the middle of the road. Um, and so I think there's just a long way to go with that stuff. But overall, I, my concern is the liability of all of it. So who's liable yeah. for that? Is Tesla liable or Tesla's going to be like, well, it's the driver's fault because, you know, they're supposed to be paying attention. But if we're going to full autonomy and we're saying now it's never the driver's fault, it's, well, who's at fault? So to put a test, you know, a Tesla semi mm-hmm. on that and basically push it like you're pushing it down a stream and it'll get to the other side and somebody can receive it is a pretty easy use case right it's not like autonomous driving through a complex city where there's people walking and people on bicycles and some guy on a on a bird you know electric scooter flying by and all this shit right like that's a whole different (laughs) challenge than like going down a, a highway at 70 miles an hour and doesn't even have to turn but i think we'll be able to get that part of it done pretty pretty soon and i think that part's really exciting i mean can you imagine you know in seattle saying okay we're gonna we're gonna send this from here to alaska and it's just gonna make this boring ass drive right across the middle of nowhere canada you know that that part of it you know i think some of those use cases i think we can get done a lot sooner than later but i just really struggle with the whole driving through a city a busy city with Agreed. stop signs and people walking and all this stuff. Like I just, and I like cars and, and I can enjoy driving, but I actually would love an autonomous car. I'd love to like be able to sit and do nothing work, you know, read email, do whatever while the car just takes me somewhere. I'm totally down with that. But I, I feel like um, eventually that stuff will happen. I think it's a little further out. Than we think. I think it's you know five, ten, fifteen, twenty years away still before they get super mainstream. I think the thing that's probably the biggest threat to automotive and car dealers that nobody saw coming was this huge shift that's happening right now to employees working remotely. Exactly. I, mean, I, I I work remote now, and I walk out to my garage every day, and I look at the fact that I have two cars, and I'm like, I don't drive either one of these damn things. I go to the grocery store a couple times a week. Other than that, I don't go anywhere. Why do I have two cars? I mean, hell, it would be cheaper to Uber to the grocery store twice right. a week than own either one of these damn things. You know, like, I just, 
I, I think there's a, a huge reality now of of you know companies embracing remote work, and that is going to absolutely crater commercial real estate. But it's going to hurt you know automotive as well. A lot fewer you know a lot a lot of people are still going to own a car, but a lot of people are, are going to make it really hard to justify owning more than one car. I think. And it also creates interesting management challenges because now you got to manage a remote team. And that's a lot different than managing someone who's right in front of you, um, whether it's in the dealership setting or another business. And I think that's an interesting, you know, segue into our next part. So after selling Vin Solutions, you started a company called Stackify based on some of the problems you encountered being the CTO at Vin Solutions. So I wanted you to talk about that as well as the journey that's led you to the Philippines. Yeah, so I, I started Stackify, like you said, to, to solve a lot of the problems I actually had at Vin. You know, we were a high growth company. Our software had all sorts of performance problems and bugs and scalability issues and all these things. And I just didn't really have the tools that I needed. So we, you know, I started Stackify to try and help solve the, those problems. That was in 2012, basically, we, I started that company. And, you know, looking, you know, going forward to today, you know, we, we built a, a product that does that. It's a great product. We have like 1,200 customers in 60 different uh, countries. Um, and it's, it's been really a really wild ride and dramatically different from then, you know, Vin, the biggest difference with Vin Solutions, the software was relatively easy to sell. You just call the car dealer up and ask to talk to the internet manager or the GM or whoever, <laughs> and you can get them on the phone because that's what they do. They answer the phone to sell stuff, right? Right. Um, you know, software developers don't have phones. They don't answer phones. So uh, they also hate advertisement, spam. They all use ad blockers, like, you know, it's a whole different world trying to sell to. And it's also very different because the business is so international. Having customers in 60 different countries is a whole different whole different thing, too. So it, it's definitely been interesting from a business perspective. And you mentioned the, the Philippines. So I actually have, uh, Stackify has about 20 employees in the Philippines. And um, part of that was our business is so international that we need 24 hour a day coverage. So, you know, we have development resources and support resources uh, there that can help, you know, kind of follow the sun and uh, provide, you know, more like 24 hour support of our, of our product for our customers and everything. And, um, you know, it's a, a global economy that we've gotten ourselves into. So we're always looking for talent wherever we can find it. So, and, from your perspective, what do you see as some of the futures in automotive and maybe some of the futures um, in technology kind of coming down the pipeline that you find really interesting? You know, and kind of what I mentioned before with automotive, I, I really am excited for the more autonomous stuff and, and electric vehicles, you know, um, most people don't realize how dramatically different driving an electric vehicle is and owning an electric vehicle. Um, you know, they're they're already talking about now that the batteries for an electric car will be basically warranted for a million miles. Same thing with the motors, the electric motors. Um, and electric cars have like eighty percent, ninety percent fewer moving parts than a normal combustion engine does and so the the biggest change there is it dramatically impacts the car dealer's ability uh, to make money off service and most people don't realize this but car dealers don't make any money at all really selling cars very right. little i mean their their margins are one two three percent they're super thin um now they're selling a car for thirty thousand dollars one percent margins not a lot of money for such an expensive transit that you're dealing with. And, but most people don't realize that. And really the way that they make money is on service. You know, it's really, they got to sell the cars to build up a fleet. It's like, Oh, we need thousands of owners. You know, we need thousands of people in our city that own a, uh, a Subaru or whatever it is. 
And then enough of them will need service and we'll make money on service. We'll charge like an absurd amount of money, you know, 75, 100, 150 dollars exactly. an hour to work on the car. Um, and that's where they make all their money is on the service, right? And that and that's fine. That's 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 perfectly acceptable. But electric cars don't need it. The, like they don't have timing belts that break. The alternator doesn't break. Like the water heater, like it doesn't have a water heater. Like like all the different things, it doesn't have them. It's totally different, right? Now they still have brakes and alignment, and eventually the power steering will go out, or the axle will have a problem. The suspension will have a problem. But it, it's dramatically different than a normal combustion car, you know, combustion engine, where the, usually the problem with those cars now is they get to be 10 to 15 years old, and it's like every month or two there's some problem with it, right? You spend more money fixing the damn thing than it would cost to just go buy a new car. Right. And that's, that's where they get to the point where it's like, okay, I'm just going to take this thing to the junkyard and crush it because it's just, the, the, you know, trying to keep this thing running costs too much money. And that that's what's going to be really interesting about electric cars uh, going forward and how that is dramatically going to change the industry. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the car dealers in the industry, you know, you have some people that are kind of conspiracy theories that wonder, you know, the, the big car dealers, are they purposely not trying to sell electric cars because they, they understand those realities, you know? And has Tesla kind of forcing their hand? Um, I don't know. We'll see. You know, I think it was really cool to see like BMW and some others that created electric cars early right, on, the like I8. the i3 and i8 and stuff like that. But all along, they make all these like really weird, freaky cars. Like <laughs> we didn't need an i3 and an i8. We just wanted a BMW 3 Series that was electric. We didn't need like all this weird shit, right? And um that's the part of it that has always puzzled me. It's like, why can't they just make like a normal car, but just make it electric. And that's really what Tesla did. They're like, we're just going to make a normal car and make it electric. And I, I think part of it was like, even think about the original hybrids, like the Honda insight and the Priuses. Yeah. It's the like original they, Prius. <laughs> they made the, they made the hybrids look so different. So that people could stand out, like it was a statement of like, "Oh, I'm driving a hybrid. Look at me. Yeah, you know, I'm Mister like Green for the world. I <laughs> bought a hybrid. Everybody, you know, take notice of that, right? And like the cars had to stand out because of that. And and that was the buyer was sort of that kind of, you know, a green buyer. Well, uh, now you know, we got to move forward to it just being like a mainstream vehicle. And that's what always frustrated me, like when BMW made the i3 and like even the other manufacturers made like these different cars, they were they were just, you know, really weird or really boring or like just didn't do that great job at it. And, uh, you know, Tesla just said, hey, we're just going to make a normal car. And they just they really nailed it with the three series. They just killed it. And now that really has forced everybody to take notice, I think. Um, so we'll we'll see how it continues to go. I don't know if you saw this, but the the Tesla three series, like a couple months ago, I think was the number one selling car in all of California, like more even than the Honda Civic for the first time. I saw that and I believe it. You know, being in San Francisco, I'm seeing those literally every day, even seeing yeah. them in my neighborhood. So I believe yep. it. <laughs> now the other thing that's changed that that'll have a little bit of impact is the cost of gas is way down. Yeah, the the cost of fuel is way down, and you know usually in in automotive, like when gas is way down, everybody goes and buys like the biggest truck they don't need, and then SUVs, as soon as gas Hummers. goes way up, they you know they trade those in and they go get little cars. So, um, but I think now we're getting real close to the point where electric cars are are becoming more normal. They're just normal cars. And being more competitive, I think Tesla's got some event coming up real soon. It's like Battery Day or whatever, and everybody thinks that they're going to announce that um, they've got like the next leap in battery technology that will truly make electric cars price competitive to, you know, more combustion engines. So we're we're still like one kind of jump away to being able to buy an electric car that's. 20 grand or whatever but like i have an employee that has a nissan leaf 
Uh -huh. Absolutely loves it. And, you know, the, the problem has been the range. Exactly. When these cars only have like 40, 50, miles. 60, yeah. 80 mile an hour range, 80 mile range is crazy because. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, originally, like the leaf and stuff, like the range was so low. And I don't know about you, but, you know, if you, you ask your friend or your wife, like, okay, how far is it to drive from here to your mom's house and back? A lot of them just don't know. Like, you know, they just don't know. And when you've got a 200 mile range, you pretty much don't have to worry about it, right? It's like, it's a long way. So you can do a lot of driving around town, no big deal. But when it's 80 miles, like, you may not make it to mom's house and back, especially if there's any kind of traffic or any kind of little thing that messes you up. Like you're running on razor thin margins, you know? <laughs> um, and I've only had that happen to me twice the entire time I've had my Tesla that I've came super close to uh, running out. And it was my fault, you know, it was my mistake. One of them, I actually, I was going to the airport and I forgot to charge the car before I left. Oh man. And, and so, yeah, that, um, but you know, for the most part that that's the big leap that happened a couple of years ago was getting the range up to 200 miles plus. And now they, the most expensive Tesla is like 400 miles, which is absurd. That's, that's a lot. I think anything over 200, I think is really good. Yeah, no, agreed. That's more of like typical sedan, but, um, yep. I guess, Besides that, Matt, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast today. It's been a pleasure, you know, talking about the VIN solution story, EVs, you know, some of the futures of auto. You know, thanks again for joining me today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. <laughs>